Amen. All right. The title of the sermon this morning is, is Introduction to Biblical Covenants. The Introduction to Biblical Covenants. So I'm going to be preaching a multi-part series on the subject of biblical covenants. So I'm going to cover you know, a really wide, you know, a really vast uh, you know, ground on this particular subject. There's numerous different covenants that are mentioned in the Bible, not only the old and the new, uh, but I really want to make sure that everybody has a real strong, firm grasp on the subject of covenants in the Bible. The old covenant, the new covenant, and just what a covenant is. And that's going to be the purpose of this morning's sermon. It's introduction to biblical covenants. Now here in Galatians chapter number 4, I want you to look with me at verse number 21. The Bible says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, <clears throat> which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter number 28. So right there here in Galatians chapter number 4, we can see the two covenants being mentioned. Throughout the New Testament scriptures, the two covenants are mentioned repeatedly. Now, uh, we're going to look at a lot, a lot of different things about these two covenants. The very first thing that I want to begin with is I want to define the word covenant for you. What does covenant actually mean? What is a covenant? So I'm going to, we're going to look at uh, the Bible's definition of the word covenant here. Look at Isaiah chapter number 28, verse number uh, 14. The Bible says, Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Now look at verse 15. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death. And with hell are we at agreement. With the overflowing scourge shall pass through. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now I want you to notice that the same statement is repeated twice here. It says this, we have made a covenant with death. And then it says this, and with hell are we at agreement? So according to the Bible's definition, what does the word covenant mean? Right here in uh, Isaiah chapter 25, verse number 18, the word covenant is used interchangeably with the word agreement. So there's a couple of things we can learn about that. Obviously, we, you know, we can learn from the word itself agreement, comparing the two, but also we can learn that there has to be two parties involved. Notice that it says, when using the word agreement, it says, um, with hell are we at agreement. So notice that there's two parties or two sides involved. Look at verse number 18 in the same chapter. Verse number 18, it says this, And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. And then it goes, you know, so forth and so forth, uh, uh, making the same statements. So notice again, Covenant and agreement are used interchangeably and there are two parties or two sides that must be involved. I want you to look now at uh, Galatians chapter number 3. Go back to Galatians chapter number 3. So we can see that agreement there is interchangeable, used interchangeably with the word covenant. So back to Galatians chapter number 3. <clears throat> And we'll get another uh, definition of the word covenant here. Galatians chapter number 3. I want you to look with me at verse number 17. The Bible says this, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, now watch this, that it should make the promise of none effect. So notice there again, we see the same way and over and over and over again, the Bible will define words for you. So first we see what is, what is the meaning of the word covenant according to Isaiah 25? Well, it means an agreement. That tells us that there are two people that are involved here. There are two parties that are involved at the very least. And that there is, there is a covenant. When there is a covenant made, there is an agreement that is made between these two parties. Here we see that the word covenant is used interchangeable with what? It's used interchangeable with the word promise. So the word covenant is an agreement or it is referring to, at the same time, a promise. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 26, verse number 28. 
So a covenant is an agreement between two parties or between two people. And it also uh, consists of a promise where people are making a promise to one another. If you do this... I'm going to do this. That is what a covenant is in very simple terms. One person saying that if you are willing to you know, uh, uh, fulfill this particular duty, then I promise that I will do this. So it's a promise. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter number 26. I'll get there myself now. Genesis chapter number 26. So we could, of course, look the, these words up in a modern dictionary, but we find more you know, valid information through the Bible. Obviously, the Bible is our final authority. The uh, dictionary definition actually is an agreement or a promise. So it's very, very similar in this sense. But I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter number 26, verse number 28. So we can validate it with the Bible's dictionary. And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee. So what would we refer to an oath as? If you had to give me a word that is synonymous with the word oath, you would say promise. I'm sure most people would use the word promise. A promise is an oath or, or swearing of that sort, right? Now here in verse number 28, we can see again that the word oath is used interchangeably with the word covenant. Not only that, again, I want you to notice that it's very clear that there are two parties involved. He says that he wants to make an oath. He says, let, that, let there now be an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and and thee. So there are two people involved and both of them have come to an agreement on what each person is going to do. They've come to an agreement in a certain you know, context or in a certain situation, a certain scenario on what they want the outcome to be. Something that they both want to take place. But there are two sides that are involved. And in order for this to take place, in order for this to become fulfilled, if you will, to come to fruition, both people agree to fulfill some particular duty or to fulfill some particular task. And one person will say, hey, if you are willing to do this, then I will do this. So what is a covenant? It is an agreement. It is a promise and it is an oath. So when we talk about the new covenant, we're talking about a promise or we're talking about an agreement or we're talking about an oath. I want you to go now to Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. Now if you look up a covenant in a, in a, uh, a dictionary, it's also going refer to refer to you to uh, it being a legal agreement. And that's oftentimes what it is. It is a legal agreement and that oftentimes there are consequences if you do not hold up your end of the bargain. That there are going to be consequences. That's why we saw the word disannul multiple times. I don't know if you noticed that, but in Galatians 3, 17, we saw the word disannul. In Isaiah 25, 15 and verse 18, it, both of those verses use the word disannul. That is again a legal term. Why? Because a covenant is something that is a legal agreement. It's a legal agreement that it's made between two people. Now the word covenant is also in the Bible used interchangeably with the word testament. Look at Hebrews chapter number 9 verse number 15. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 15, the Bible reads, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might, excuse me, receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And just because... I believe that everyone fully understands this. This is actually the two covenants being spoken of. It talks about the redemption of the tr transgressions that were under the First Testament, right? So you have the New Testament, you have the First Testament. These are two co covenants. And what took place was one covenant, they didn't uphold their bargain. And what were there? There were transgressions. The one side that agreed to, hey, I'll keep the law. And, what, and we're going to look at what is the old covenant. It's the law. The one side said, hey, I'm going to keep the law. They went into an agreement or a covenant, a promise or an oath. And if you remember, they actually swore saying, yes, we will keep the law. We will keep the covenant. God, on the other end, you know, he obviously had his side of the bargain. And he said, if you do this, then you shall be a people unto me. You'll be a peculiar people. And he made his covenant with them. Well, they broke that covenant. They, there were transgressions under that covenant. So obviously, in that sense, the covenant was disannulled. And that's what takes place when a covenant is broken. They didn't uphold their bargain. One side of the, uh, uh, um, you know, of the one party of the covenant did not uphold their side. They broke 
the covenant. And then that's why the new promise is offered, the, 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 uh, the New Testament. And that's, it mentions it there, and notice it's referred to as a promise. It says, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's talking about the New Covenant. The, those that had sinned under the Old Covenant, they have the opportunity of the New Covenant to receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now notice there it was referred to as a testament in verse 15. I want you to look now with me at chapter 12, verse 24. Look at chapter number 12, verse number 24. <clears throat> It says, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Now, if you are noticing the parallel or not noticing the parallel, in verse number 15 it says, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. In chapter number 9, verse number 15. So he's the mediator of the New Testament. In chapter number 12, verse number 24, he's the mediator of the New Covenant. So we can find words that are interchangeably here. Number one, we can see that covenant and testament are perfectly interchangeable. The New Covenant is the New Testament. And what is a testament or what is a covenant? It is an agreement between two parties. Both people agree to certain conditions and there are certain things that each party is going to uphold in this agreement. Now what is also the agreement referred to as? It, it is a promise or it is an oath. The, uh, both parties are promising that they are going to uphold the agreement or they are swearing or making an oath that they are going to uphold the agreement. And when this binding goes forward that is a covenant or that is a Testament. I want you to turn with me now to Exodus chapter number 24. Exodus chapter number 24. So now we're going to look at quickly what is the Old Covenant. We saw the Old Covenant mentioned there a few times, the Old Testament. Exodus chapter number 24. We're going to look at verse number 1. Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 1, and I'll preach a sermon in the future where we'll dive more, you know, uh, uh, more uh, specifically into this, more detailed. But uh, right now we're just going to do an overview. This is going to be an intro. It's probably going to be a shorter sermon, but it's just going to be a, uh, an introduction to this particular subject of covenants, biblical covenants. These are the two main covenants, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Let's look at what is specifically the Old Covenant. Look at Exodus chapter number 24. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. So I want you to notice what is that? That is an agreement. So the Lord put forth standards. He put forth specific conditions that he put forth to specifically the children of Israel. And I want you to notice that at the end of verse number 3, they agreed to those conditions. So the Lord said, hey, I will do this if you will do this. Now we're going to get more into detail in just a moment on the Lord's side of the agreement. Go to verse number 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. Verse number 6. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the, watch this, book of the covenant, and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do, and be obedient. So again, notice that it's the book of the covenant. It's the book of the agreement, or the book of the promise, and that, you want to know what were the conditions of the Old Covenant? Well, it's the book of the covenant. It's the first five books that Moses pinned down. It's specifically referring to, if we want to be very specific, the law and the Ten Commandments. Look at verse number 8 now. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning 
all these words. So that's the proof, or this is meant to be the token, or the seal, if you will, that God agrees to this covenant just as they had agreed. Now flip over with me to Hebrews chapter number 8. Now leave your hand here in Exodus. Leave your hand in Exodus. Look at Hebrews chapter number 8. Hebrews chapter number 8. <clears throat> Look with me at Hebrews chapter number 8. I want you to look at verse number 13. This is spoken of in the New Testament scriptures. Hebrews chapter number 8. Look at verse number 13. <clears throat> We're going to flip over to Hebrews 9 after this. So Hebrews chapter number 8 verse number 13 says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now flip over to Hebrews chapter number 9. So notice that that covenant is now referred to as the old covenant because there's a new covenant that has replaced it or, or that new covenant has um, uh, uh, you know, been established now. Look at Hebrews chapter number 9. Look at verse number 18. Hebrews chapter number 9 verse number 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book, and that's the covenant, the book of the covenant, and all the people. That's the people that had agreed to the book of the covenant. Saying, this is the blood of the New Testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So that was the moment where it was consummated. That was the moment where the agreement was made final. Where the, fi where the agreement was finalized. This is, if you will, the time when you sit down with the car salesman or the time when you sit down you know, with the, the mortgage broker, whoever it may be, and you're getting ready to sign on that dotted line. This is that moment that took place between God on one side of this agreement. You know, If you look at the, the situation of purchasing a car, they say, hey, we're going to sell it to you for this amount. That is on their side of the agreement. And then you on the other end, you, know, you maybe bargain that for a period of time. You, know, you, 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 you try to bargain with them and then you decide, I'm not paying that amount, I'm, pay I'm paying this amount. Maybe they say, okay, I agree to that. You also say, okay, let's do this. They pull out the paper. There's a, mo there's a time when that covenant is sealed. And that's the moment when you sign your name. Well, when all of the people stood there and they agreed to all of it, there was a moment when the covenant was sealed, where this covenant is finalized and there's no going back and you have sworn and you have, you have promised that you are going to uphold your side of the bargain. That moment in which the covenant was sealed was when the, the blood was sprinkled on the book, which was the book of the covenant to be a sign. And then also it was sprinkled on the people whom God hath enjoined himself in this covenant with. And that was meant to be a sign or a token that God had agreed as well. I want you to keep looking there. Look at verse number 21. Verse number 21 the Bible says, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And then it tells us this in verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now I want you to look over with me. Uh, I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9. We only have three other scriptures that we're going to look at this morning. So I want this to be the introduction. Now, these are you know pretty, uh, uh, maybe somewhat obvious points, if you will, but I want you to really grasp these, these clear definitions of each point that's being made. So, number one, what is a covenant? What is the definition of a covenant? It is an agreement between two parties. Remember he says, betwixt us. Not only that, it is an oath. It is something that people swear to, or it is a promise. It is also referred to as that. Uh, furthermore, a covenant is also, the word covenant is used interchangeably with the word testament. So a testament is a covenant. And what was the old covenant? The old covenant was the, was the book of the law as it is referred to. It is the commandments that God has presented or given to, and specifically the Ten Commandments, and we're going to look at this later, that He gave to the people. And what did they do? They stood back 
And they agreed. So it was betwixt, just like Jacob said betwixt, that's who was speaking in Genesis, betwixt us and thee. It was, in this case, it was between God and the people of Israel. Both sides agreed. And God on his end, he said, you know, if you keep my commandments and you keep my testimonies, then you're going to be a peculiar people unto me. You're going to be a people above all the people in the earth. So that was his side of the bargain. You'll be the children of God or the people of God. On their side, of course, they agreed that we will keep your commandments. We will keep your testaments. Then there was a moment when that testament or that covenant is sealed. And that moment takes place after they agreed where the blood is sprinkled. And in order for there to be a testament... It says in Hebrews 9, 16, there must be, be the death of a testator. I'll read it to you. For a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So it's not official or it's not finalized until that blood is sprinkled. That is the moment where they signed on the dotted line. When they were standing there after they had agreed, Moses took the blood and he, and he of course, used the hyssop. And he sprinkled it, which is like a plant. He sprinkled it on all the people. And then he, for a sign of remembrance, took the book that they had agreed to. They had the blood on them. And then the book that they had agreed to had the blood on it. So sometimes we forget about this. But of course we have the Ark of the Covenant, right? That's the Ark of the Old Testament. The Ark of the Old Covenant that they had agreed to. Well, that, the, the Ten Commandments that were taken... That is the covenant that they had agreed to. Those Ten Commandments were taken, and the Book of the Covenant were taken, and it was put in, the Ten Commandments that is, put in the Ark of the Covenant to be a testament against them, to be a testament or a, a sign or a token that they had agreed to these things. So that blood also was sprinkled on, you know, uh, the, uh, the, for the New Testament, it was sprinkled on the testament. Uh, you know, in heaven as well. So you can see these parallels there. So Romans chapter number 9. The other point that I want you to... to uh, so those are the first two points I wanted you to remember. The third point is this. Look at Romans chapter number 9. We're going to look at verse number 4. The third point is this. The covenant of the Old Testament and the covenant of the New Testament. And I, I mentioned this briefly in um, the sermon in Hebrews 8 was given to the nation of Israel. They were both given to the nation of Israel or given to the, uh, the nation of Judah. I want you to look with me at Romans chapter number 9. Look at verse number 4. <clears throat> Actually, let's back up because I want to get the specific context. Look at verse, chapter 9 verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have, a, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now, who is he speaking about? To be very specific. Speaking about the physical Israelites. He even says, according to the flesh. This is not spiritual Israel. This is not those that are saved. It's specifically his kinsmen according to the flesh. It's physical Israelites. Look at verse number 4. Who are Israelites? That's physical Israelites. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory, now watch this, and the covenants. That's plural. And the covenants. And the giving of the law and the service of God. And now I believe this, this right here is being restated or reiterating covenants. It says, and the promises. So you notice over and over again, covenants is used interchangeably. Look at verse 5 to further prove that this is the physical Israelites. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So that is speaking of physical Israel. There's no way out of it. And that, command, and that covenant of the old covenant, no one would disagree with, was made with physical Israel. But notice that it doesn't only mention the old covenant. It doesn't only mention one covenant. It says who pertains the covenants. The covenants. The new covenant or the New Testament was made with the nation of Israel. I want you to go now to Ephesians chapter number 2. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter number 2. But this is what we have to keep in mind. Just because they are of the nation of Israel does not mean that they 100% take part in that covenant. That's who we made the covenant with and the agreement with, but that does not mean that they take part automatically. There is a condition in order to take part of that covenant. And the condition is faith. So in order to take part in this, 
He told and he gave it to all of the nation of Israel. In order for them to take part in this covenant, he delivered it to them and he gave it to them. He spoke it to them and he promised to them that I will do this, but they have to fulfill their side of the agreement. And what is it? It's faith. This is a major misunderstanding when it comes to replacement theology. Because there are a lot of things that are right about replacement theology, but it's not as cut and dry as oftentimes people that believe in replacement theology uh, preach it and try to make it out to be. The new covenant was made with the nation of Israel. It was. The new covenant was with the nation of Israel. But in order for that to apply to them, they have to uphold their side of the agreement. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter number 2, further proof of this in the New Testament. Look at verse number, um, let's look at verse number, let's first start with verse number 8. It's a perfect place to start. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now watch. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So I want you to notice that they were Gentiles in the flesh, excuse me, in time past. Now look at verse number 12. That at that time ye were, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now I want you to notice that what takes place at the moment that they get saved is that they are no longer a Gentile. What are they? They are now of the house of Israel. It tells you specifically in verse number 12 that at that time ye were without Christ. And it says, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now notice that when they took part with Israel and they became of the house or the commonwealth of Israel, what also did they get to take part in? They were no longer strangers from the covenants of promise. Why? Because that covenant was given to Israel. At the moment that they were, were made of the house of Israel, they also took part in the covenants that were given to Israel because why? What did Romans 9 say? It says that the covenants pertained to Israel. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter number 31, verse number 31. So this is a major point. I'm going to build upon this um, in later sermons. This is going to be the last place that we turn to. But this is a major point um, in understanding the covenants in the Bible. <clears throat> now, those that were of the nation of Israel, did they automatically in the Old Testament even get to take part in the covenant and the blessings that God would give to them? Just automatically? No, I mean, were they taking part in those blessings when they were, let's say this, were they taking part in the blessings when they were in Babylon? Of course not right. Not, they, they definitely weren't taking part in those blessings at that time. So I want you to notice that there was still a condition even at that time. Now he completely disannulled the covenant at one point where he's not even going to uphold. You know, it, that covenant is, is vanished away, the Bible says. But even in the Old Testament time period, Old Testament scriptures, if you will, even during that time, if they weren't obedient, then God at that time was not going to bless them. And they were not going to be treated as His people and be a peculiar, a peculiar people above all the, you know, the nations of the world, even in the Old Testament. They still had to uphold their end of the bargain even then. And that didn't even mean that they were saved. Obviously, the New Covenant and the Old Covenant, uh, as far as the promise itself, were in existence both at the same time. And I'm going to go over that in the sermon on the history of covenants. So look at Jeremiah chapter number 31, verse number 31. This is where it's very clear. Look at verse number 31. The Bible says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So what does he say he's going to do? He says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Look at verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. 
So notice that they didn't uphold their side of the agreement is what he's saying. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And what is their sin? Their sin were the trans... If you remember in Hebrews 9, the transgressions that were under the first testament or the first covenant. So he ended up forgiving those when he established the new covenant and the blood specifically of the new covenant was what covered the sins of the old covenant. And notice that this is, as I mentioned in Hebrews 8, that this is an eternal covenant that he's going to make with them. It's, it's a covenant that's not going to ever go away. But who is this covenant made with? It's clearly given to, and it pertains to, as Romans 9 says, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But of course we know in the New Testament that they don't just automatically get to take part in this new covenant or in this new testament. There is a condition, just like there was a condition to the old covenant and the old testament. And in order to take part in this covenant, in order to take part in this testament, you have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to believe in the blood of the testament or the blood of the covenant and trust that only for your salvation. You have to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do so, you are at that moment, um, you know, you're at that moment adopted into the house of Israel. You're at that moment, you officially become an Israelite when these covenants pertain unto you. So like I said, there were specific points that I wanted to get across that are going to be building blocks and foundational going forward to the other parts of this series. That's why I refer to this as introductions to biblical covenants. Number one is what is a covenant? Very, very basic. What is a covenant? It is an agreement. It is a promise. It is an oath. It is also used interchangeably with the word testament. So a covenant is a testament and it's an agreement between two parties. You know, there are conditions that are laid out. Both parties agree to them. And then uh, it is sealed with blood. The, the, you know, that there must be the death. You know, if there's a testament, where a testament is, there must also be, it is of necessity that there must also be the death of a testator. When that blood was sprinkled, that was them being joined together. It says, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath enjoined himself unto you. It was sprinkled and at that moment it was finalized. It was, you know, actually sealed and there was no going back. And that was the sealing of the old covenant. What was the old covenant? It was the law. It was the book of the covenant and they verbally agreed to it. And that was the old covenant of the old testament. And then who do the, who, who, you know, who does the covenants pertain to? We have to keep this in our mind going forward. We're going to have a, a firm understanding of how all these covenants work, the New Testament, the Old Testament, the, what aspects are replaced, all of that. Who, who does the covenants belong to? They belong to Israel. Now, does that mean that Israel today, physical Israel today, is just, uh, you know, just a bastion of righteousness, that they're just God's chosen people today? Not even close. They don't, they, they, these covenants might have been given to them. I can give a covenant to someone, but they don't keep it. And they're not a part of it until they fulfill the said conditions. Now, that's what happened. All of these things were given to them. They were offered to them. That's what it means. It pertains to them. When he spoke these words, the covenant was first given to Abraham. That's what that means. But they must fulfill the conditions in order to take part in this covenant or in this testament. So we can't go so far with you know, the replacement theology and, and, and not understanding that the new covenant even still pertained to Israel and pertained to the house of Judah. And when we get saved, we're not just saved and just, you know, just in God's family, if you will, which we are, but we must understand and keep in mind that we become a part of the house of Israel. That's what takes place. Because why? Because that's who the covenants were given to. That's who the promises were given to was Judah. That's why you know we, we become inwardly a Jew at that moment like Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29 uh, speak of. So we take part in that covenant because the covenants pertain to Israel. We then are considered an Israelite in God's eyes. We are adopted into the nation of Israel which are God's chosen people 
And I'm not talking about just physical Israel today. You have to differentiate these, you know, these two specific things. So uh, that's going to do it for the introduction of biblical covenants. A lot of these sermons are going to feel like they end abruptly, maybe sometimes without an application, because you'll notice that this is more of a Bible study. So, uh, and there's also, it's all, they're also abruptly because there are multi parts to it. We're going to pick up where we left off. Sometimes there'll be continuity between the two subjects. Uh, so we're going to be studying biblical covenants, and uh, there is going to be no particular whether it's the morning, whether it's the evening, they'll kind of go back and forth, but we'll be going through this for a period of time. So, uh, you know, in your Bible reading, pay attention to these types of things and we can grow in our learning and understanding of this subject more and more. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the promises and the covenants that you... You know, we're willing to come into a, an agreement with just mortal man, uh, with, the, with the, the, the creature. Help us to understand our lowliness and help us to understand our, 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 our worth, dear God, especially in your eyes, dear Lord. Uh, we're so thankful for, for everything that you've done, that you were willing to, to uh, enter into an agreement uh, or a covenant with us. Uh, we ask you, dear Lord God, that you give us an understanding of this subject, that we could grow in understanding of the subject of biblical covenants, dear Lord, and uh, that everyone be a attentive during this time and that we could just learn more and more according to your word and be more appreciative for the New Testament. We love you and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.